A network client points to a router called a default gateway to get out to the rest of the world. And if that default gateway were to go down, the client's stuck on its local subnet. So it would be a good idea to add some redundancy to our design. And that's what we can do with HSRP, the hot standby router protocol. We can physically have two routers, but logically it appears that we have a single router. By the way, HSRP is a topic on both the new CCNA and Encore exams. Now let's go out and take a look at an excerpt from one of my training courses where we'll take a look at the theory and configuration of HSRP. In this video, we want to review HSRP, the Hot Standby Router Protocol. You learned about this initially in your CCNA studies, but we want to dig a little bit deeper into the configuration in this video and show you some additional options. But just as a quick review, HSRP is a first hop redundancy protocol, meaning that we can have a PC like we have on screen, we have PC1, and it points to a default gateway that's really a virtual router. We're pointing to not a physical router, we're pointing to a virtual router with an IP address of 10.1.1.1. That's our default gateway on PC1. Notice that's not the IP address of either R1 or R2. However, R1 can actively service packets destined for 10.1.1.1, but if something were to happen to R1, we've got R2 that's a standby router and it's going to notice that R1 is no longer available and R2 is going to take over and it's going to be able to service packets that are destined for 10.1.1.1. Otherwise, we've got a single point of failure that would prevent the PC from getting out to the internet, but now we're getting some redundancy thanks to HSRP. If you're wondering how R2 knows that R1 is no longer available, well, R1 is going to periodically send hello messages over to R2. By default, it's going to send a hello message every three seconds. And if R2 is not heard from R1 within what's called the whole time, which defaults to 10 seconds, R2 assumes that R1 is no longer available and R2 is going to take over. By the way, the whole time must be at least three times the hello time. And again, by default, the hello time, the interval at which we send hello packets, is every three seconds. The default whole time is a little bit more than three times that. It's 10 seconds, but 10 seconds might be a little bit slow to converge by our standards. We could speed things up by adjusting the timers. But under normal operation, we're going to be going out through R1 to get out to the internet. But let's say that something happens to R1. Here we're saying that R1 goes down and R2, after the whole time has expired, R2 is going to take over as the active router. And now packets going out to the internet are going to go through R2. Now let's review some of the characteristics of HSRP. First of all, it's a Cisco proprietary first hop redundancy protocol, meaning that if you're in a mixed vendor environment, you might not want to go with HSRP, but if you're an all Cisco shop, yeah, HSRP might be your first hop redundancy protocol of choice. It is defined by RFC 2281, and the terminology for the two routers that we have here are the active and standby routers. And we've got a couple of versions of HSRP that we want to talk about. Version 1 is going to assign a MAC address to the virtual router in this format. It's going to begin with a vendor code of five zeros and a C, followed by 07AC. The last two hexadecimal digits in the virtual router's MAC address, that's going to be the hexadecimal representation of the HSRP group number. And we'll see that when we get into the live configuration here in a moment. There is a second version of HSRP you might want to configure. It uses the three rightmost hexadecimal digits to represent the HSRP group number. So we could have more group numbers if we wanted to. By the way, one of the advantages of version 2 versus version 1 is that we could have sub-second timers. We could have hello timers in the milliseconds. And we could have, for example, 300 millisecond hello timers. And we could have a whole time of 900 milliseconds. So on a really fast network that's typically very reliable, yeah, we can have very fast switchover. Something that's not obvious though is if R1 in this case had been the active router and went down and whatever caused it to go down, let's say we fixed it and it came back up, at that point you might expect that it would take back over the active role, but by default it doesn't do that. If it goes down and comes back up, even if it has a higher priority, which is what determines who becomes the active router in the first place, even if it has a higher priority, it's not going to regain its previous role as the active router unless we enable a feature called preemption. 
I want you to know that with HSRP, preemption is disabled by default. And we said the default hello time was three seconds and the default hold time was 10 seconds. And when we're sending the hellos out, those are destined for a multicast address, meaning that the active router doesn't have to know the IP address of the standby router. It's not pointing to the standby router's IP address. It's pointing to a multicast address. And the standby router has joined that multicast group and it's listening to that address. And with version one, here is that multicast address. It's 224.0.0.2. But with version 2, they changed that to 224.0.0.102. And something else I want you to be aware of is with HSRP, the virtual router's IP address, in this case it was 10.1.1.1, that cannot be the same IP address assigned to one of our router interfaces. R1 or R2, they couldn't have 10.1.1.1 as the physical interface's IP address. We're going to see that's different with our next first hop redundancy protocol, VRRP, which is why I bring it up here. But we cannot have an interface's IP address equal the virtual IP address. Now let's go out and take a look at configuring HSRP and some of its features. In this topology, our PC is pointing to a default gateway of 10.1.1.1, and the PC is actually a router, but it's configured as a, as a PC where it's not running a routing protocol. It points to a default gateway to get off of its local subnet. Let's see if we can ping this IP address that I'm saying lives on our internet. Let's ping 1.1.1.1, and it's going to fail. It's going to fail because we don't currently have a virtual router that is set up. Let's change that. Let's go over to R1. We want this to be our active router for our HSRP configuration. And we'll go into global configuration mode and we'll go into interface gigabit 0 slash 1. That's the interface on the same subnet as our PC. That's important. And we want to configure an HSRP virtual IP address of 10.1.1.1. And the syntax is a little bit Non-intuitive here, you might expect that since we're configuring HSRP, then the uh, acronym of HSRP is going to be part of the command. Actually, it's not. We're going to use a series of standby commands. We're using the word standby instead of HSRP. Specifically, I'm going to say standby, and I'm going to give an HSRP group number. We could have more than one group on a router. We could be participating in different HSRP groups off of different interfaces, perhaps. So I'm going to say this is group number 10. And the IP address that we're going to be servicing is 10.1.1.1. And I want this router to regain its active role if it goes down and comes back up. Remember, we called that the preempt option, and we said it was not enabled by default. To enable the preempt option, we'll say standby, give the group number of 10, and say preempt. Oh, notice that just by enabling HSRP, we're suddenly active for group 10. Now we've turned on preemption. Let's say standby 10 priority, and I'm gonna set the priority higher than the priority that we're gonna have on R2 because the higher priority wins the election to be the active router. And I'd like you to know that the default priority is 100. I just wanna be greater than that. So I'll say priority 110. That's gonna make me greater than 100. And we'll say end. I've now configured R1. Let's go over to R2 and configure that side. It's a similar configuration. I'm going to go into interface gigabit 0 slash 1. And I'll say standby group 10. That needs to match. The IP address that we're servicing is 10.1.1.1. And I do want to enable preemption on all of my routers. Standby 10 preempt. But I'm not going to set the priority value. I'm going to leave the priority value at the default of 100 because I want R2 to be the standby router and I want R1 to be the active router. Now, let's see how things look right now. Let's do a show standby brief command. That's my favorite command for verifying HSRP operation. By the way, you see that we just went to standby because we learned there's an active router for this group. And here we see that for interface gigabit 0 slash 1 for group number 10, we've got a priority of 100. The P in this column means that preemption is configured. Our current state is standby. The current active router is 10.1.1.2. That's R1. The standby router, it's us. It's local. And the virtual IP address that we're servicing is 10.1.1.1. Let's take a look at this from the perspective of R1. Let's go there and do a show standby brief command. 
Here, the big difference is the priority is 110, and as a result, we're active. We can see that's our state. We can see the active router is us. It's local. Now, notice I gave the command show standby brief, and that gives me usually all the information that I need, but I can get more information if I want by just doing a show standby without the brief option. This will show me, for example, MAC address information. The active virtual MAC address, because we're using HSRP version 1 right now, here's the MAC address. Because when the PC wants to send a packet out to the internet, not only does it need to go to the IP address of its default gateway, it needs to know the MAC address of its default gateway in order to properly form a frame. And what does it do? It sends out an ARP broadcast to say, hey, can somebody tell me the MAC address of 10.1.1.1? Well, our active HSRP router is going to respond and say, yeah, that MAC address is this MAC address that we have right here. We see our timers, they're at their defaults of three seconds for the hello time and 10 seconds for the whole time. We see that preemption is enabled just like we configured. It says that the active router is local and the standby router is 10.1.1.3, that is R2, and its priority is 100 we see. And our priority is configured to be 110. Now, let's test this out and let's see if I can do a continual ping over on my PC. First of all, let's just confirm that I can get to 1.1.1.1. Now, the first time I thought we might have an ARP timeout, we didn't. If we did, if we lost that first packet, no big deal. But here, it looks like we're successfully talking to the internet. Now, what I'm gonna do is start a continual ping that's gonna go on for a long, long time, and I'll go over to router R1. I'm gonna shut down that gigabit 0 slash 1 interface, and we'll see it switch over and start using R2 to get out to the internet. And we'll see how many packet drops we have. All right, let's try this ping command. I'm gonna say ping 1.1.1.1, but I'll say I wanna repeat for a count of some really large number, I don't know what that number is, but we're pinging a lot. And see, all these are successful pings. Now let's go over to R1 and let's do a shutdown on that interface. I'm gonna go into interface gigabit zero slash one and I'm gonna say shut, short for shutdown. All right, let's quickly bounce back over to the PC and see how many packets we've lost. Looks like we've dropped a couple, three, four, Giving it a few more seconds. I'm expecting about a 10 second delay. Now, by the way, here's a disclaimer because I'm doing this with a virtualized set of routers. I'm using Cisco Viral for this. The timers don't work like they might work in the real world with real gear, oddly enough. Uh, because in the real world with real routers, when I shut down that bottom interface on R1, it would have seen that I was taking down this interface that was, oh, by the way, you see that everything is resumed now. That was really too long of a delay than, uh, that's longer than we would have with actual gear, but it's because, again, I'm using viral. Let me see if I can stop this. R1 would have seen that we were shutting down the interface and we would send out a resign message. If we were doing a packet capture, we would see an HSRP message that said resign. And that router would say, all right, don't, you don't need to wait for me to stop sending hello messages for the whole time interval. I'm proactively resigning because I know this interface is going down. The other side would have seen it and it would have gone active almost immediately. So it would have been a very fast switchover. If the router had literally been unplugged or something like that, then there would have been that 10 second delay. We had longer than 10 seconds it felt like just now. Again, that's because the timers don't work perfectly with the Cisco Viral Router Emulator. So it'll work a little bit different in the real world. All right, let's get back to the action and let's bring the interface back up. Let's go back over to R1 and let's say no shut. All right, let's do a no shut here. Now, again, in the real world, we might want to make the timers shorter to make failover happen quicker. And even though context sensitive help suggests that the default version of HSRP version one, it makes it look like we can set hello timers to the milliseconds and it'll actually take the command, but it doesn't work right. If we want to really use sub-second timers, we need to be running HSRP version two. And also HSRP uses an IP multicast address of 224.0.0.102 we mentioned instead of 224.0.0.2. That's what was used by HSRP version one. 
The reason that Cisco changed that is that 224.0.0.2 could conflict with some CGMP messages that older Cisco Catalyst switches might have used in a multicast environment. Now let's see how we can adjust the version and the timers. So here on router R1, let's say standby and let's give some context sensitive help. By the way, notice that we're active once again. If I wanted to specify the MAC address instead of having one automatically generated, I could do it with this command. I could adjust my timers with the timers command, and I could set the version with the version command. What I want to do right now is set the version to version 2. So I'll say standby version 2. And I'll say standby timers and we'll give some context sensitive help. If I want to use milliseconds, I'm going to say msec, and I can give milliseconds for my hello interval. And I'll say I want to send a hello every 100 milliseconds, and for my whole timer, I'll say I want to use milliseconds there as well, and I want that to be, remember it has to be at least three times the hello timer, so I'm going to make it exactly three times. I'll say my whole time interval is going to be 300 milliseconds. Now, I need to make this match on R2 because right now we have mismatched HSRP versions and that's just not going to work. So let's fix that. Let's go into router R2 interface gigabit 0 slash 1. And I'll say standby version 2. And I'll set the timers the same. I'll say standby timers msec 100 milliseconds for the hello timer msec 300 milliseconds for the whole time. All right, we're all matched now. Now here are a few debugging commands we could use if we want to see what's going on or if we want to troubleshoot HSRP. We could do a debug standby. Let's use some context sensitive help. And we could look at all the errors or the events or the packets. Cisco has curated a collection of some of the most important debug output though, and they put it in this option. This is my favorite. We can do debug standby terse. Again, that's going to give us a little bit of the errors, a little bit of the events, a little bit of the packets. It's Cisco's curated collection of debug features. Let's say debug standby terse. And let's make something happen by going over to router R1 and shutting down that gigabit 0 slash 1 interface again. So let's go back to R1 and let's go back into interface gigabit 0 slash 1 and let's shut it down again. All right, let's press enter and then we'll quickly jump back to R2 and let's see what kind of output we got there. It looks like this router is no longer active and here's that resign message I said that we would receive in the real world. We received it here, but the timers just didn't behave as expected. But here's that resign message that router R1 proactively sent us telling us that it was about to go down. So we received a resign message coming in from 10.1.1.2. Now, if I want to turn off debugging, I'll do a U all to say undebug all. And now let's fix router R1 again. Let's go back into that interface and we'll say no shut. All right, we'll no shut that. We'll say end. And now let's talk about a feature called, well, it's an older feature called interface tracking. If you take a look at that topology, imagine that something happened on the link between router R1 and the internet. So in other words, that we could see that, no, that link is down. We should not be going through R1 to get to the internet. That's a bad way to go. But how would R2 know that? I mean, from the perspective of R2, it's still receiving hello messages coming from R1. How does it know that R1 is not the best choice to go after the internet? Well, it wouldn't by default, but there used to be a feature called interface tracking that would allow us to say on R1, hey, keep an eye on this, uh, this top interface, and if it goes down, then I want you to decrement your priority to some lower value so it would lose its active role. Well, interface tracking by itself is no longer a separate feature in Cisco IOS, it's now grouped into something called enhanced object tracking. Now what I want to do is on R1 
configure things such that if that link goes down, it's specifically gigabit zero slash two that goes out to the internet. If that goes down, I want to decrement my priority by 20. That's going to take my priority from 110 and bring it down to 90. Suddenly, 90 is going to be less than the priority on R2 of 100, and R2 is going to take over. Here's how we set it up today with modern Cisco IOS. Again, it used to be an interface tracking configuration. Now it's enhanced object tracking. And here's the way we set it up. Let's go into global configuration mode and into interface gigabit 0 slash 1. And I'm going to say standby group 10. I want to track object number 1. Now we've not defined object number 1 yet but we will in a moment. I'm going to say, let's track object number one. And if object number one is in the down state, then I want to decrement my priority value by 20. Now let's define tracking object number one. I'm going to say track one, and let's use some context sensitive help. Actually, I need to be in global configuration mode for that. So let's back out and I'll say track one. And I want to track the interface of gigabit 0 slash 2. Specifically, I want to track the line protocol of gigabit 0 slash 2. And if that interface goes down, this tracking object is going to go down, and that will cause us to decrement our priority by 20. So let's take a look right now at the output of the show standby brief command on R1. I'll do a show standby brief command. This is like we saw earlier. Currently, our priority is 110, and as a result, our state is active. Now, I'm going to shut down not the bottom interface going down to our switch and the PC and over to R2. Now, I want to shut down the top interface. That's gigabit 0 slash 2, which gets us out to the internet. So let's go back into global configuration mode and then into interface gigabit 0 slash 2, and I'm going to shut down this interface. We press Enter. Notice immediately it tells us that the state is down on our tracking object and we've transitioned out of active and we're in speak and that means we're on our way to on our way to standby so let's take a look now at the output of the show standby brief command look at this it says now our priority is 90 what happened well the reason it's 90 is because that tracking object went to a down state and we had a configuration that said we want to reduce our HSRP priority for group 10 by 20. So it did. Now let's bring it back up. In fact, let's do this first. Let's do a show standby command without the brief. And it's going to show us that we're configured for 110, but currently the priority is 90. And that's because the tracking object decremented our priority by 20. All right, let's fix it. Let's go back into interface gigabit 0 slash 2, and I'll do a no shut down. All right. We see everything's coming back up now. Let's take a look at another HSRP configuration while we're into this discussion of the enhanced object tracking. Let's say that we want to monitor router R1's IP routing table. Maybe we're looking for a certain IP route via R1, and if it's not available, then we don't want to use R1. We could say I want to decrement the priority if this route disappears from my routing table. Now to do that, I want to create a static route for some non-existent network. We'll say it's network 2.2.2.0 slash 24. And I'll point to an interface of null zero, which doesn't go anywhere. And then I'll say I want to track that network. Here's how I do that. I'm going to say IP route 2.2.2.0 with a 24-bit subnet mask. It's just a static route I'm creating. I'm going to point it to null zero, which is like a bit bucket. It doesn't go anywhere. Now, if I do a show IP route, we're going to see that we've got a static route for 2.2.2.0. And I'm going to say that I want to track that route. We're going to see if it's in our routing table. I'm going to create tracking object number two to do that. So let's go into global configuration mode and I'll say track object number two. We're going to be looking for an IP route of 2.2.2.0 slash 24. And what are we specifically checking for? I'm going to just see if it's there. Can I reach it or not? Is it in my IP routing table? Or I could say, is the metric of a certain value? If the metric gets bad based on changing network conditions, I could decrement my priority based on that. But here I'm just going to say, is it reachable or not? We'll say reachability. Now let's go back into interface gigabit 0 slash 1. And let's decrement our priority by 20 if this tracking object number two goes down. I'll say standby 
10, track, 2, decrement, 20. And let's do a show standby for interface gigabit 0 slash 1. Just to remind ourselves of how we're configured right now. Notice we've got a couple of tracking objects. We're saying if our interface of gigabit 0 slash 2 goes down, that's going to be tracked by tracking object number 1, and we're going to decrement our priority by 20. Or tracking object number 2, if it goes down, we're going to decrement our priority by 20. And that's what we just set up. We're monitoring to see if 2.2.2.0/24 is in the routing table or not. All right, let's go back into global configuration mode and let's say no IP route 2.2.2.0, 255, 255, 255.0. All right, let's end. And you see we've already gone down. We've transitioned from an active role to a speak role. Let's take a look at our interface. Let's do a show standby gigabit 0 slash 1. And once again, we see that our priority is 90, even though we're configured for 110. And the reason is tracking object number 2 is down. All right. Let's fix that now. I'll just put that static route back in. I'll say IP route 2.2.2.0, 255.255.255.0. Pointing to null. Zero, press. All right, we see that we came back up. We're once again active, awesome. Now as a final HSRP configuration, let's consider a security question. What's to prevent someone from adding a rogue HSRP router to our network, setting the priority really high, and then taking over the active role? That would be forcing traffic to flow through their router. They could be capturing that traffic. Well, to prevent that, we can configure authentication. HSRP supports both plain text and MD5 authentication. We probably don't want to use plain text credentials across our network. That's not secure in and of itself. So let's use MD5, Message Digest 5 authentication. We'll configure it on R1, and then we'll go over and we'll configure it on R2. And we're going to use a key string. That's an interface configuration mode string of characters. We're going to do that instead of a key chain. A key chain is a global configuration where we can set time periods during which different keys are valid. Some keys are valid during working hours maybe and some keys expire on Thursday and we can be really creative with that. We're going to keep it simple though and we're just going to set up a matching key string on each router. First on router R1, let's go into interface gigabit 0 slash 1 and I'm going to say for standby group 10 I want to enable authentication again we could say MD5 or plain text I'm going to say MD5 and I'm going to use not a key chain but a key string so I'll say key string and I'm going to make that key string let's say uh, I'll cryptically write the word secret so instead of the S I'll use a dollar sign instead of the E I'll use a 3 CR3, and then I'll do a capital T. Not, not super secure, but you get the idea. I'm trying to be a, a, a little sneaky with my naming here. So I'll spell that secret using some interesting characters, and we'll make that match over on R2. So let's go over to router R2 and set up a matching configuration. Let's say interface gigabit 0 slash 1. Standby group 10, authentication MD5, key string is going to be dollar sign 3CR3 capital T. Hopefully those match. And let's do a show standby for interface gigabit 0 slash 1. Oh, and we just went to standby, so let's issue that command again. And it says we're using MD5 key string authentication and our current state is standby and that's what we want on R2 right now. So everything is working as expected. Now, although we're done with our HSRP configuration, Cisco does have a couple of design best practices for us to consider that I want to make you aware of. The first recommendation Cisco has is make the layer 3 switch that's acting as the VLAN's active HSRP router the spanning tree root bridge for that VLAN. So here, I'm using routers, R1 and R2, but if those had been multi-layer switches, and let's say that our PC was on VLAN 100, and we said that R1, or maybe it's multi-layer switch 1, was our active HSRP router, make that the root bridge for spanning tree protocol. 
So that's the direction we're flowing anyway. And Cisco's other recommendation is when two HSRP Layer 3 switches are servicing more than one VLAN, maybe we've got multiple interfaces and we're participating in multiple HSRP groups, Cisco recommends that we do some load balancing. If we have R1 and R2 both servicing 10 different VLANs, for example, well, let's make R1 active maybe for five of those VLANs and R2 active for five VLANs. So we don't have one router that's overwhelmed with the role of being the active router. We get to do a little bit of manual load balancing that way. And that's a look at HSRP, the hot standby router protocol. Well, I hope you enjoyed that training video. And if you did, and if you're curious as to whether or not the CCNA certification might be right for you or not, I've got a free mini course to help you decide. All you have to do to get this free mini course is to go to kwtrain.com slash CCNA hyphen mini. That's going to expose you to some additional CCNA content and help you decide if this is a path you want to go down or not. Now, if you like this video, do me a favor and click on the like button below and be sure and subscribe so that you don't miss out on any of my upcoming videos. Thanks for watching.